Hey guys, Derek Best, Beacon Fight for Life. As you most likely have heard, or if you haven't heard, what we're about at the Beacon Fight for Life is reconnecting the Australian multicultural community. Our main goal is to reduce the number of Australians taking their own life in Australia. Currently, suicide is the leading cause of death of all Australians 15 to 44 for men. Uh, Indigenous people are three times likely to take their own life, and, and it's sad to say that 65,000 people a year in Australia attempt suicide. So the Beacon Fight for Life, we want to reduce the number of people taking their own life, and so what we're going to, we're going to play over the coming months is some footage of conversations I've had with individuals, groups, multicultural, you name it, I'll interview them, so that we can start to make inroads for people um, to stop them from taking their own life give them information and places to reach out to. So, stay tuned. I've lost my kids, my partner, my home, my dignity, my role, all my dreams just gone. They say I'm a bad parent, that the kids don't want to see me. It's not true. I'm so stressed, I'm not coping, my job is at risk. I'm already in debt. Why is this happening? Does anyone believe me? What do I do now? Russell, Russell Michael, um, welcome today. Thank you. Funny story, before we get started, Russell, you know, 20 years ago, um, I, we, we crossed paths, I was on Innovative Hair Loss Solutions on the Russell Goodrick Show. And uh, here we are 20 years later, and we're talking about parental alienation. It's amazing because neither of us have aged. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> and Michael, welcome. Thank you, Derek. Um, my first time meeting you, sure. but um, divorcepizza.com. Sure, yes. What's that about? Right, um, well, I was uh, cut off from my kids uh, due to the family court process um, over 16 years ago, and the last five years I've been trying to understand the problem, so I've been researching it, etc. And then, with help of some other people, produced the website Divorce Pizza. And the idea is it shows um, from that pie there that roughly a quarter of kids whose parents separate don't have any contact with their parents at all. And another half of them have a very reduced relationship. You told me previously, just before, 300,000 sure. children have no contact with their children. Is that true? Yeah, that, that's right. That's across Australia, so it's around about 30,000 children don't have any contact with a parent. And Russell, you said something about 1.2 million. So across Australia, mm. uh, there are at least 1.1 million children mm. who don't live with one of their parents. There are, of that number, there are more than 300,000 who don't see one of their parents at all. That's crazy. It is, it is damaging the social fabric of our nation. That must have a significant impact on the Australian community. Now, Michael, they, they're saying that the 21, it said that 21 men a week in Australia are taking their own life. Is there any science behind that? Um, that exact figure, there's, there's no specific science, but it is a very big number, similar to that. There was a study done um, in Sweden over nine years of um, just under a million children whose parents were separated, and they looked at the, the outcomes for the children and the parents. And of the fathers who are cut off from their children, they had a 460% higher rate of suicide than the general population. The numbers are staggering. Mm. Uh, in Australia, in 2019, there were something like 3,300 uh, people that committed suicide. Of those, 2,500 were men and 800 were women. It's a 40% increase over the last 10 years. And the children are often forgotten. Um, the same study, there was uh, twice the rate of suicide of children from broken families. Mm. Now, suicide's the leading killer of young people, 15 to 24. So we're talking about huge numbers of children. Mm. It's actually 15 to 44, but you yeah. know, that's another statistic, 15 yeah, to sure. 24, yeah? Yeah, that's right, yeah. 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 So, so the most common reason for males 30 to 45 is divorce and separation. Wow. The, most, the second most common uh, reason for males 45 through 65 is divorce and separation. What, what role does the family court play in this? 
the family court plays a very significant role. Um, there was an inquest into the murder of two young children by their mother in Port Denison. The inquest was published a couple of years ago and the coroner determined that the mother's psychosis was as a result of the family court proceedings. So what the coroner said was that the stress from family court proceedings was a contributing factor, if not the precipitating factor, in her psychosis. So we know that family court stress causes people to do some very bad things, including kill their own children. While we're on that, it's a horrible subject, but is it true that women are said to murder more children than men? Um, mothers do statistically murder more children than fathers in Australia. There was a study produced by the Australian Institute of Criminology last year that looked at um, parents murdering their children over a 12 year period and they found that 47% for, um, of the children murdered were murdered by their mother, 14% were murdered by her partner and 38% were murdered by the father. So that completely debunks the myth that it's safer in cases of um, dispute or acrimony for the children to go with the mother. It's not to demonise the mother, but it's just to no. say, look, this, this idea that fathers are inherently dangerous to their children compared to mothers is not true. And there's, and there's support, there's statistics to support. Well, there is. That, that's by the Australian government. The statistics are even stronger if you look at the US, which have got a much more comprehensive reporting system. Mm -hmm. Ours is very selective, our reporting system by the Australian Institute of Criminology. It focuses on homicides. Now, there's lots of cases where children die as a result of parents killing them, and they're not homicide. But doesn't the court act in the best interest of the children? Um, that, that's the mantra that's used. Um, but best interest of the children, um, one famous lawyer has, has said about the best interest of the children, the best interest of the children is an empty vessel where people pour their prejudices into, and that's Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. So someone else that's uh, quite famous is the Australian Psychological Society, and they had a statement published on their website uh, till a couple of years ago that there is no science behind determining the best interest of the children. The other problem being that uh, a couple of years back, uh, Senator John Madigan in Victoria, now passed, um, there was a Senate inquiry and uh, basically they brought before them the CEO of the family court mm. and they asked the CEO how many children went through the family court and he, wouldn't, he wasn't able to tell them. He, they, they then asked the CEO uh, what was the outcome for the children and again there was no answer, they couldn't give an answer. So the family court has never done an inquiry, as far as it's known, into the outcomes for children after they've gone after their parents have gone through the family court. So how do they know what's in the best interests of the children? So it's like they're putting out fires on the day, but there's no follow-up. That's right. So isn't it as simple like you go to the family court and you get a court order? Isn't that how it works? Well, 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 you do, but I mean, the process for the court order, I mean, you look, look at the people who are making the, des the decisions. Okay, the judge makes the final decision, and a lot of people say, okay, they're, they're, they're wise, etc. Yes, they're highly trained lawyers, um, but um, some lawyers and some judges will, will say that really this isn't a decision they should be making. If you have a look at the Divorce Pizza website, there's a video by Justice Harvey Brownstone, a family court judge in Canada. And he, he says, look, we're lawyers, we're, we're not trained in social work, we're not trained in psychology, we shouldn't be uh, making decisions about children. Uh, there's another video on that same website and you can see uh, an academic from Harvard University, Dr Stephen Miller. He, he talks about um, a lot of the experts, um, psychologists, psychiatrists, all of these people, um, most of them don't understand the psychology of what happens in the family court and they get it exactly wrong. So we're getting people making these decisions, most of them very well meaning, but really they're not trained or educated in the process and none of them have any education in the long term outcome for children. You know, you have to look at a family court judgment to see, I mean, I've, I've looked through 
thousands and I've spoken to people who've looked a lot more than me, including lawyers, and none of them can refer to a family law judgment where the judge has referred to the long-term outcomes for children or the psychological abuse of children that happens. So this, this is a whole process. And then you get to the process, you get an order. And we've met people and they've gone for years in the family court and they finally get an order for access or custody. And the custodial parent just breaches that order with impunity. They just say, look, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna let my kids see the other parent and nothing happens to them. There's no penalty, there's no infringement, so it's... But surely it's enforced if there's an order in place. No, it, it's very rarely enforced. Mm. Um, it, it's extremely unusual. 99.9% um, .9 or thereabouts, there's no consequence, there's, there's, no, there's no penalty, there's no infringement, there's no jail, there's no one who physically goes and grabs the, ch the, the, the children. It's just, it's a crazy system. Russell, why are you so passionate about this subject? Uh, well, I've had uh, a lived experience of the family court. Uh, I was in family court for five years and I haven't seen my children for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so 15 years all up. And uh, I've uh, obviously from that uh, tried to support other mums and dads going through it and, uh, and children as well. Uh, and because of that, I've now a part of uh, Parents Beyond Breakup. And, uh, and also uh, in, in Western Australia, uh, men's health and well-being. That quote that you read at the beginning there, yes, that was from the Parents Beyond Breakup. What does that mean to you? It means a lot. Uh, what it means is that uh, if you're going through uh, this situation of the family court, you don't know what to do. Uh, so often you uh, talk to relatives or friends who have no idea how bad the family court can be. Mm. And so by going online, it used to be in person, but these days it's by Zoom because of COVID-19. But you can go online and talk to uh, other people that have gone through the family court. Mm. And uh, therefore you get more of an understanding of what to expect. What do you say to the people that are going through this process and they feeling alone or hopeless. What would you what what it, what what would you suggest for them? Well, I would suggest uh, to uh, have a look at the uh, Parents Beyond Wake Up uh, website. Mm. Uh, on that, uh, you can book a Zoom call. Uh, it's pretty easy. Anyone can get on. Mm. Whether you're a mum or whether you're a dad, you can book into one of those uh, online. It's not so much of a course. It's just a, a discussion and uh, basically you can learn a lot more about the family court and you can learn more about what you should be doing in certain circumstances. Does it cost anything? It doesn't cost anything. So it's free? It's free. And it's a wealth of knowledge? It is. From people who've lived experience like this? Absolutely. Yourself. So it'd be a fantastic resource to use? Yeah. Would you recommend it over the family court? Uh, or as part of the process? Uh, I would recommend it uh, as part of the process to uh, look, the family court uh, obviously has a lot of success, mm. uh, but there are situations where they don't have that success. Mm. And that's when two people just can't agree. And, and that's the biggest problem for the family court. Mm. If you can agree beforehand, if you can make sure that, you know, mum's looked after and dad's looked after with the kids and mum's looked after with finance, and you can make sure that everything's going to be fine after the divorce, especially for the kids. Mm. You know, you can go forward, you can just write out the orders, go into, go into court, get them stamped, approved, and then you can go and have lunch together, if that's what you'd like to do. On the other hand, if there's, if there's one partner who is uh, not willing to go to uh, mediation, for instance, uh, there is a real, there is some real difficulty with that. Mm. And so that causes a lot of angst and it costs a lot of money in the end. It can cost, mm. I've, I've known of cases costing two, three, five hundred thousand dollars. Uh, and that's a lot of money mm. to, to, to give to other people just to get a point across. Yeah. Michael, what, what point would you like to get across with today's discussion? Um, well, I, I'd like people to realise that um, family court isn't the only way to go, that there's, there's other ways to go through this. And family breakdown, it's a human, it's a, it's a social problem. It becomes a medical problem. If, if, if acrimony drags on for, for long enough, 
um, the stress causes long-term health impacts. So I'd like to see people uh, reach out to organisations like um, Dads in Distress um, and also read some of the information that we've got on Divorce Pizza and the links to, learn about the impact on children and try and talk to all your extended friends and, and family and uh, where possible the, the, the other parents, friends and families, the benefits of shared parenting and get everybody to, th to think like that. And does, it, does it cost anything to look at the information? No, the it's absolutely free. People can have a look and what we've got, we've got fridge magnets and um, we're recommending that people put those on their fridge if they're separated, that both parents on there have it on the fridge and the fridge magnets have got um, key information to help protect those children. Mm -hmm. um, now, if people don't want to buy the web, the magnets, they can buy them from the website. They can just print out the, the, um, the image and cut it out and put it on their fridge. Um, but what people can also do, there's a lot of people out there who've been affected by family breakdown and they're upset, they don't know what to do. Um, what they can do, rather than put huge amounts of resources, like Russell was talking, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if, if people have got that much spare money, put some of that aside and, and give it to some of the organisations that are trying to do something about this problem. That's great advice. Um, you, there's also places you, you, you've suggested that people shouldn't go. The Duluth model, can you explain that? Right. Did I say it right? Duluth? Yeah, that's right, the yeah. Duluth model. Um, the Duluth model, um, it's a gendered model of domestic violence and what it basically predicts is that domestic violence is caused by males and females are the victims. Well, sure, that happens, but it is two-way. Females can be perpetrators. So if, if a man is um, going through a hopeless situation like Russell read out at the beginning there, um, there's some organisations, he might ring them up and they've got this Duluth model mm. and he's ringing them up saying, look, my partner's bashed me or whatever it is, uh, and he won't be getting very good support because they will be saying to him, look, um, she wasn't the cause of the violence, you were. And that's very disempowering for, for men mm. and it can lead them to, to do some very bad things. So what we would say, if, if you're going through family breakdown problems, and you're looking for help, have a look and do a bit of research about an organisation um, to see if they've got the Duluth model mm. anywhere in their um, makeup. Mm. So look at their website, ring them up, talk to them, but you do need to do a bit of research because a man can feel very hopeless if um, he's been a victim of domestic violence or psychological abuse and he rings up and he's told he's the perpetrator. Mm. So. Um, just be aware of that. Yeah. I think violence restraining orders are absolutely necessary. Um, violence uh, can never be condoned. Mm. Uh, certainly violence is wrong in any manner and anybody who commits violence, um, I'd be quite happy to see back in jail. Mm. But the trouble is there's so much perjury about. So many people perjure themselves about violence and, they, and so somebody will get a violence restraining order against them that really doesn't deserve a violence restraining order. And they're simply used as uh, a, a way to try to get uh, a benefit in the family court mm. and to keep the other parent away from the children. And in fact, it does that. And so basically, um, what needs to be done is I know that's made easier and easier to get a VRO, and I think that's not a bad thing. Uh, you can even get them online these days, and that's not a bad thing as well, as long as it can be proved that that person is a violent person because, um, you know, so many men are now feared to even do anything, go anywhere. It's like, it feels like a war against men. Well, we all agree that women can be the victim as well here. Y yes, yeah, victim, victims can be any gender. Oh, know. absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, uh, we, uh, we've talked to many women who have been victims of violence and and uh, and uh, victims of false VROs. Mm. Um, so uh, you know it goes both ways, but something really needs to be done uh, with uh, how these VROs are just handed out, mm. and uh, it's it's just not right. Yeah. Well, Russell, as you said, you're you're part you're on the board with the Men's Health and Wellbeing in Western Australia. Yes. 
So if people wanted to reach out, they could get you through there. What was the best way that people could reach out to you if they wanted to? Get well, if they go uh, go online, they can go on to uh, onto the website, and indeed on the website. Uh, if, uh, in particular men obviously, mm. if they're having problems and need to know who to contact, mm -hmm. there's, uh, there's a whole list of contacts on there, uh, several hundred, depending on what the circumstances that they're, they're after. Mm. And Michael, how can people get hold of you? Um, and, and why would they get hold? What would be the... Well, if, if they want to contact Russell or me, they can go to divorcepizza.com and submit a, um, an email through there. Um, we're not set up with call centres like some of these organisations, we don't have the resources, but if people do want to contact us, they can go there. So we're really um, more for the people who want to do something about this and if they want to join in some of the campaigning that we're doing to bring an end to this, mm -hmm. um, we're the people to contact. But if they're going through a difficult time and they, they need support, parents beyond breakup, it is a great place to go. Well, thank you both for your time today. As you know, the Beacon Fight for Life, it's all about reconnecting the Australian multicultural communities. So conversations like we're having today with, the, you know, it's said that 21 men take their own life a week. In Australia, I think it's a, it's a terrible number, significant, um, that needs to be looked into. Um, and by making headways, by discussing it, letting people know that they're not alone, if they're feeling hopeless or they're feeling lonely, that they can reach out to people like all of us here. Um, and we'd like to see maybe some changes made in the family court. Would that be fair? Yes, yeah. Yeah, but that's another long, we could probably sit here all day and yeah. talk about that, so. Um, I, I, think people, uh, I think people need to come to realise that no matter how much they dislike the, their uh, former partner or ex, no matter how much they dislike them, no matter how much they'd like to do to them, they must consider the children first. Mm. Consider the children, what effect it's going to have on the children, because there can be some great psychological uh, problems for the children as they grow up and in later life, uh, depending on how uh, the divorce is handled. So what I'd like to say about that, when people go through a divorce, they all say, look, I'm gonna put my children first. I wanna look after them 90% of the time or 100% of the time. Now, if you have a look on Divorce Pizza website, there, there's a video there by a family court judge, Judge Michael Scopolitis mm -hmm. from the USA, and he talks about those people, and what he's saying is everyone needs to recognise those people. They're, when they say that, 99.9% .9 of them are doing that for their own purposes. So if you've got a friend that says, look, I'm considering my children first, but I want to care for them 90% of the time or 100% of the time. It's like an oxymoron. Yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. Um, so what happens at the moment, we tend to hear those stories from friends or people we know and we, we, we offer them support and everything, but if you hear those kind of th stories, think twice. The other, the other problem that comes to mind, and I'm sorry, I know that you finished off a moment ago. <laughs> oh, that's fine. The, the other problem that comes, comes to mind is that uh, children who are alienated from one parent um, there's a problem because the, the, the alienator will cut off anyone that tries to talk to the children about seeing the targeted parent. Would you agree with that? Yes, yes. Yeah. People just don't understand it. People think, oh, one parent's not letting them see the other one. It, it, it's for um, bona fide reasons. But really, anyone who sees this ought to be very careful about it. Russell, you've had first-hand experience of that. What advice would you give that? custodial parent that may be taking that path of not allowing the child to see the, the other part, the other parent? Well, as I said before, I think no matter how much you dislike the other parent, for whatever reason, you should always, for the benefit of the children, let, allow them to see that other parent, uh, obviously depending on circumstances of whether that parent is violent, etc. But generally speaking, they aren't. I think these days they simply use the VROs and the and alienation as a, as a means of revenge. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you for having much. us. Thank you, Derek.